I would like to give a very warm welcome to Dr. Lynette Holter, Archivist and Director of Instructional Resources, and also the Director of the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture, which is affectionately known as NADAC here. Um, Dr. Holter wears an awful lot of hats and she knows more about our data than anybody. So Dr. Holter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. That's the last time I let you introduce me because you always set the bar higher and higher. Um, while you're still here, I saw earlier in the week that in our adopted data set that the Dunham's dance data was winning. Is that still the case? Because you know that's a NADAC study, so. That is the case. And if anybody's here live, um, I'll put into the chat that you can still adopt a data set from ICPSR as part of Love Data Week. I personally adopted the Dunham data set, so I have a soft so spot I. for that. Yeah. Oh, it's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. I'll put that in the chat too. Awesome, thank you. Um, as you can tell, uh, this is not going to be a very formal presentation. Um, any of you who have seen me before know that that goes without saying. Um, if you haven't, uh, I apologize in advance. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is uh, I'll set expectations and tell you sort of where I'm coming from with this presentation. And then we'll look at what ICPSR data tells us about love. So we'll look at the love that we have for other people, um, the things that we love, uh, the questions that are in the ICPSR um, uh, collection uh, that include the word love. And uh, I'll also do a brief um, couple slides on what open ICPSR has to say about love. So in thinking about this presentation, I thought Love Data Week, um, we always try to do sort of a showcase of what's in ICPSR data. Wouldn't it be fun to do a session about what data say about love? Just sort of flipping the words around. So that's how this one came to be. Um, it's a little bit lighthearted. Uh, there's some that's not quite so lighthearted, but um, in general, this one's probably uh, more lighthearted than some have been in the past. Uh, all of the data that I've chosen are um, directly downloadable. So um, none of them are restricted or if they have a restricted component, they are, uh, there is also a public use version of the data. Uh, many of the data sets that I'm showing you are members only, so you may have to log in um, if you choose to download the data and be associated with a member institution. Um, and if you're not sure whether you're at a member institution, Anna can pop that link in the chat um, and you can look and see if your school's name is on there. Uh, but you don't need to log in at all. Um, or be at a member institution or have meet any other qualification to look at the documentation. So a lot of what I'm showing you is actually coming right from the documentation itself. So, um, so you can take a look at that. And um, I have put links in all of the slides and Anna um, is gonna share those slides with you. So feel free to sort of play along with me. Um, I know that listening to somebody read through a lot of uh, links is not the best way to spend an hour. So I've both tried to change the format of my presentation, but also given you those links in advance so that you could um, ignore me and just play until your heart's content. Um, I do wanna put in a disclaimer. Uh, okay, maybe two. Um, so the first disclaimer is one that you've heard from me before. Uh, the data that I have um, chosen here are examples. They're not an exhaustive list of what ICPSR has on any given topic. Um, you'll notice that one, uh, any of you who are familiar with ICPSR data, um, you may know that our most popular study is always the National Longitudinal Survey of Adolescent to Adult Health or Ad Health. Um, you'll notice that that one doesn't come up in here at all. Um, and I did that because that one kind of gets a lot of play on its own. So I chose some other data sets that may be a little bit less common. And the second disclaimer, which is one that you haven't heard from me before, is I've included some sort of tidbits in here uh, that come from ICPSR data. And I want to just put it out there that these are not meant to be research. They're just meant to pique your interest. So um, don't go citing these on... Uh, you know, social media and saying, but Lynette said, because <laughs> um, that would be bad. So um, 
just a couple hints and reminders before we get started. Uh, if you don't use the ICPSR website every day, um, the search box is always at the top. Um, and you can also use that find data drop down menu. Um, that's always that second tab over. Um, I did mention that I put the hyperlinks to each study um, on the slides. I've also tried to remember to link any of the images uh, that I put that were like from our social science variables database or whatever. I tried to put the links behind those, um, but I probably missed a couple. Um, in the search results, uh, there are a couple of things to note. Um, the search, whatever you type in the search bar actually searches across studies, um, which are what we call our data sets. Uh, the variables or the individual questions within those data sets, um, the series that are comprised of the data sets, the data related publications, so any bibliography entry that we've um, identified that has that word or um, is otherwise associated with your search results will show up there. And then also um, the ICPSR website is that last tab. Um, when I searched for love, uh, the love data week. Um, information came up on that that last tab. Um, so you can just navigate between those tabs right at the top. And I also wanted to remind you that you can use the facets on the left hand side or the filters um, on the left hand side to narrow down your searching. And you can um, sort the study results that you get. Um, when you get your results returned, you can sort them by um, they automatically come up by study relevance, but you can also sort them um, into uh, the ones that were most recently collected, uh, the ones that were most recently put out, um, or what we call most recent updates or um, releases. Uh, and you can also uh, look at the ones that are most cited in the bibliography. So just a couple different ways of um, looking at the results that you might get. Um, I also have taken to using a minus open ICPSR when I do most of my searching. That keeps all of the results in what we call ICPSR's curated collection. So those are going to be the, the data sets that have the code books with them, um, that in most cases are available in all of the different statistical formats. Um, it's going to have the, the level of documentation that you've come to expect from ICPSR. Um, so you'll notice in in uh, some of the screenshots that I've taken with search bars that I almost always have uh, minus open ICPSR. So I tried to hook you in um, in the description by noting that uh, over half of uh, US adults believe in love at first sight. This wasn't always the case. Well, and actually we don't know if it's still the case, but um, uh, this uh, little uh, graphic or um, screenshot from the social science variables database shows you that that percentage actually increased um, pretty steadily from January uh, 2010, which is the one that's um, presented in the middle. I don't know why they came up in the order that they did. Um, uh, January 2012 is the one that's on the bottom. And then the 55% um, is pulled from uh, November 2012. I tried to look at uh, the Roper Center for um, there to see because they have a, a lot more polls than we do. Um, and so I wanted to see if they had more recent information on belief in love and first sight and love at first sight. And theirs, um, their most recent was 2015, and it was just slightly higher. It was like 56%. So um, maybe by now we're at 65% or maybe the pandemic has made nobody believe in love at all. Um, anyway, just your tidbit for the day. So thinking about love that we have for each other, I broke these down into a couple different um, different groupings. So one of the first, the first grouping is uh, the love between parents and children. Um, and you'll see when we get to the questions uh, section, that there are actually quite a few uh, studies in the ICPSR collection that ask questions about um, either the, the child's perception of the parent's love for them or the parent's perception of the love that they show for their child or their child's love in return, the amount of support that goes back and forth sort of intergenerationally. 
um, particularly with older children. So um, I figured that was worth looking at. Um, so one of the studies that was of interest to me was this consequences of recent parental divorce for young adults. So this looks at adolescents. Um, they were 18 to 23 at, um, in 1990 when they were first interviewed. And, and the focal group had parents who had divorced within 15 months of that first interview. Um, they also have the principal investigators have also surveyed a comparison group of about another 300 um, young adults in the same age categories uh, who were in intact families so that you can see the sort of the effects of divorce um, uh, more clearly because you're comparing it to families that didn't experience that event. Um, and the data include uh, information about young adult transition behaviors. So when do they move out of the house? Or I guess these days, a better question is, do they move out of the house? Um, it looks at family relationships. So how close are the parents and the children after the divorce? And what does that look like compared to um, those whose families never experienced that, as well as um, well-being of the, the children, focal children? Um, we also have a number of studies that look at specific family-based programs. Um, so I listed a number of them here. Uh, several of these are what we would consider evaluation studies. So they too have a comparison group. Um, so they look at people who were part of the study, um, the who received, who participated in the program, um, and then they compared them to uh, a group of um, individuals who did not participate in the program. So they were looking at sort of effectiveness. But just a couple different um, different kinds of uh, projects um, that I've listed here. An older study. Um, so if you're interested in sort of a historical perspective, um, the quality of American life studies um, were done in 1970 and 1978, um, which seems like eons ago, but um, really wasn't, I guess. <laughs> um, but they look specifically at um, Americans' perceptions of the quality of their lives and what makes their life have meaning. So it includes information about um, their relationship statuses. So if they were married or in a long-term relationship, um, kind of how did that start? How did they meet someone? Um, I think this is the this is the one that I initially started looking at because it had a whole lot of, um, of questions about how did you meet the person that you're now with? Um, and so I was interested in looking at uh, whether people who met on a blind date um, were still together uh, more or less frequently than people who didn't meet on a blind date. Um, this study didn't have online analysis capabilities and I was a little lazy and didn't download it to um, find out the answer. So if any of you wanna look at that um, and let us know by the end, uh, that's perfect. Um, but anyway, it also talks a lot about um, relationships with other individuals. So um, it, the, the basis of it is um, relationships between the focal person and their uh, partner sp or spouse. Um, but it also looks at intergenerational relationships, both up and down. Um, so their parents and their children, uh, and also their friends. So how much they interact with friends, how much they support their friends, how much they feel their friends support them, um, and what that adds to their overall life satisfaction. And the interesting thing about this study is that it looks at both um, that gratification, but also the frustration with the with those different areas of life. Um, another study that looks at uh, families and friends is the Community Partnerships for Older Adults. Um, and this is part of a series of studies that, that look at how um, successful adults are in, in, as they transition sort of through the different stages um, that we think about uh, sort of happening from retirement on. So 
this one looks at um, adult independence, but also asks a lot about um, the support that people get from family and friends, um, particularly in relation to whether it um, they feel it will allow them to stay in their homes longer, um, remain independent longer. There are lots of questions overall in um, ICPSR data that ask about social support from friends. Um, I didn't include any. I, you'll see the next slide is just friends, but um, I didn't include any uh, data about friends' roles in delinquency or um, risk-taking behaviors, but there are a lot of studies that look at that. Um, there are a number of studies, probably more than I um, expected that look at the ease of making friends. Um, so including that even um, just as one variable or a couple variables in a larger data set. Um, so if you're interested in uh, friendship, um, we do have data about that. And a number of the studies um, that I've included here and things like Ad Health include uh, friendship networks. So you can, you can look at um, how things disperse throughout those networks. Specifically looking at partners, um, we have the marital instability over the life course study, which is holds a, um, a special spot in my heart because it's the data that I uh, used for my dissertation. My uh, advisor collected it. Um, but it actually is one of the very first studies of couples to think about marital quality in multiple dimensions. So they look at um, disagreements, they look at stability of marriage, um, they look at marital satisfaction. So uh, they don't think of marital quality sort of as a um, single indicator. Um, and one of the things that their data have been used to study is um, the risk of divorce. So kind of looking at those people who say they're, they're not very satisfied in their marriage, but um, but they also don't get divorced. Their, their relationship is very stable. Um, so they started the study in 1980 with a group of married individuals so that they could follow them over time and kind of see who got divorced and who didn't. Um, so it's a prospective study of marital stability. And they um, later expanded it to include the offspring of the focal people and then they added a new cohort in um, the late 1990s. So um, the, the data span um, from 1980 through uh, 2001. The Health and Relationships Project um, looks at, is interesting because it includes specifically um, spouses who are in uh, same sex as well as different sex marriages, and they look only at people who are legally married, um, ages 35 to 65. Um, but it includes uh, both survey data, um, where they ask people about their relationships, and then it also includes um, a 10 day diary where they prompt people every um, every night to look back at their day and, and think about what they did and what their social interactions were and things like that. Um, the married and cohabiting couples study um, is a nationally representative study only of heterosexual couples um, about the same age range, 18 to 64. Uh, the thing that makes th these data interesting is that they have information um, on both the individual and the couple. So they've got um, I think it's 700 married couples and 300, a little bit more than 300 cohabiting couples. Um, and they have information um, from each of the partners individually, as well as from each partner about their relationship and their spouse. So um, that's kind of uh, a unique um, aspect to these data. They also look at relationship quality. Um, stability. They look at, uh, it does include questions about how they, um, how they met. It looks at um, family dynamics, including um, both support that the individual receives from his or her spouse, but also um, from other family members. And uh, this one actually includes questions um, about uh, later life care, which is really interesting if you think about it um, 
in terms of cohabiting couples where um, sometimes legally um, they don't have the the right the same rights as uh, married couples do. So um, some pretty interesting questions there. They ask specifically about power of attorney, power of attorney, and things like that. As I was looking at these, I came across some teachable moments. And so um, if you've heard me before, you know that I can never pass those up. Um, so I thought I'd share a couple with you. Um, these are all from that sort of um, uh, family and friends kind of um, topic. And so the first one is um, from the How Couples Meet and Stay Together, um, which is another popular survey of um, relationship uh, dynamics. And this one, if you were to present this to your students and you were just to have them kind of look at the colors, um, the question is, oh, this one is the blind date one, um, sorry. So in general, how, how would you describe the quality of your relationship is um, what's on the, the left side and across the top is whether they met on a blind date or not. And so we always we often have these perceptions that people who meet on a blind date are less satisfied. And if you look at the data quickly, it's gonna it's gonna say, yeah, that's true. That dark red box is um, for the people who uh, met on a blind date and say their relationship quality is poor. However, if you actually look at the numbers in that box, you'll see that's only four people. So um, a, just a good example for if you're working with students. Um, to teach them to, to take this with a grain of salt. Um, and just because it has a dark color doesn't mean it's a significant relationship, significant in terms of importance. Um, the, the next panel on here is something that um, some of you may have heard me talk about before. Um, when I teach uh, sociology of the family, I like to have my students think about how what we know about the family is um, shaped by what we ask people. And so um, the American National Election Study is not, doesn't have anything to do with um, relationships or um, uh, how you met your spouse or anything like that. Um, but it is a longitudinal study that, that asks uh, respondents for their marital status over time. Um, and so in this table, you can't see the whole table because it's it goes down to 2000, um, 2012, but across the top is the different marital statuses. So there's married, never married, divorced, separated, and widowed. And then the last one is partners that are not married. And respondents had to volunteer that information except in 1986 and 2012. And what you see is that there are a number of people who, um, I think there are like 500 respondents who choose that option in 2012 because it was given to them. Um, but people earlier don't think to say that. So I often ask my students, well, where did they put themselves? Um, because it's not like people started, you know, cohabiting or considering themselves partners um, without being married, um, you know, in the mid 1980s or early 1990s when they start including it as an actual category. So again, just a way to think um, about um, something that we might take for granted um, using data. This is another example. Um, this is from the Marriage Matters panel study of newlywed couples. So this is a study of individuals who participated in this Marriage Matters um, program in the state of Louisiana, and they have to like sign a covenant and um, go through additional counseling before they get married. And there are um, guidelines to the program. They follow people over time. So there are thir three waves of data. Um, and so, uh, you can see in this first one that um, most uh, of the respondents say that they kiss each other at least every day. Um, if not every day, then several times a week. That gets at those two categories together, um, get at over 90% of the respondents. And then you look at wave two and you start to see, well, wait a minute. Now it's we're down to 60% saying every day and um, even if you add the two categories together, you've only got 
not quite 70% of people. So do are people really, do they stop kissing each other? And is, you know, is that inevitable? Um, you can also look at, because this is sort of an ordered scale, um, we do cheat and look at things like the mean. Um, and this one is interesting. Uh, in the first one, it says that the mean for the group is 5.84, which means it's between this several times a week and every day. Um, and this next one, if you look at it, the mean is 7.62. And you're like, oh, wait, how can that happen? Um, well, it's because um, there are data that are missing. So this one person didn't answer the, the study. We declared it as missing. Um, or we labeled it as missing. We said that they didn't answer the question, but we didn't um, take that extra step and take the those numbers out of the calculations. So it's counting that one person that says 999 as a valid frequency. Um, and then wave three, you can see that the mean goes up to 10.84, even though the um, percentage of people kissing several times a week or every day is down to under 50%. Um, again, that's because now there are two people who didn't answer it and they're coded as 999s. Um, so that's your statistical reminder lesson for the day. The other thing that if you're working with students on data like this, you wanna talk to them about is um, what happened to the people who are no longer together and are therefore no longer answering the question? So um, you can see in this last wave that there are 324 people who are um, who didn't either didn't get this question or were not together and so weren't interviewed or whatever the the answer is. But um, it's very likely that that's also related to um, frequency of kissing. Um, anyway. We also have data about um, dating behaviors and potential partners. Um, so uh, Yahoo Personals Dating Preference Study um, from 2004 to 2005, I kind of laughed when I was reading the summary of these data because it reminded me that it, in those days, Yahoo was the biggest online um, dating site. Um, now, very few people uh, use Yahoo at all, I think. Um, but they look at personal ads from, um, I think it's either four or six major cities. So it includes New York City, Los Angeles, um, the usual suspects, Chicago. Um, so it takes the ads that were posted by people in those cities and it looks at both uh, um, or provides you information about both what the person, how the person described themselves, but also what they're looking for in a mate. So um, the, uh, the citations um, to studies that have used these data have done a lot looking at um, different uh, racial makeups of couples and also um, uh, description of body type um, or, yeah. So just some interesting things if you're looking at sort of how people get into relationships. The Toledo Adolescent Relationship Study is, um, I kind of think of it as a, a smaller ad health. It's a local study in Toledo, Ohio, um, but it includes both qualitative and quantitative information. Um, it's longitudinal. So it, it interviews people at three different points in time. Um, and it specifically is looking at how adolescents think about their relationship and make meaning of the different behaviors within it. Um, so uh, you can see I took a, a screen grab of um, their answers to uh, whether they will only have sex with people with someone they love. Um, so 50% uh, of the people said that they either agreed or strongly agreed that they would only have sex with people that they love. Um, so that kind of goes against what we think of um, teenagers today, you know, as you see them portrayed kind of in the media. Um, especially with friends with benefits and hookup culture and all that kind of stuff. This kind of goes against that. Um, and the other, uh, the other one I just realized didn't copy the question, um, but the question that I took a screenshot of here is um, whether people feel like they fall in love easily. 
Um, so again, these are teens. Um, and most of them disagree that they fall in love easily. So um, they either uh, strongly disagree or disagree. Um, so just again, your tidbit for the day. We also have international data on uh, relationships. So the East Asian Social Survey is the um, sort of the partner survey to the general social survey. There's also the Japanese social survey. Um, but this one is cross-cultural, um, cross-national. So it looks at families in, um, I believe it's 32 countries in East Asia. And it asks respondents about, um, about their family members, who's in their household, who's in their family, um, how often they talk to them, um, how often they uh, interact with them in other ways, like doing something together, um, and then the intergenerational support that goes back and forth. This survey on rust ranges was a new one for me. I don't remember having seen it before, um, but it looks at family life for both couples who are in rural settings and urban settings during a time when um, Russia was going through sort of a democratization. So it looks at marital histories, it looks at experiences, it looks at attitudes. So it even asks people um, what their attitude about divorce is um, in a culture where divorce had not been um, very predominant. Um, and then lastly, uh, I included this one because it seemed um, timely. So this is a similar study of um, structural change, social change and personality under conditions of um, radical social change looking at um, Poland and the Ukraine. So the, the main focus of the study is on occupation, but they also ask questions about um, interacting or socializing with family and friends. So this is a, um, another way to sort of plug. Often people are searching on the ICPSR website and if they don't find a study that's about the specific thing that they're looking at, they think, well, there might not be any data there. Um, many of these I found by looking through the variables. So they were data sets that were not necessarily classified as being about relationships. They were about something else like occupation. Um, but they actually have quite a number of relationship related variables. So um, just something to, to remember as you're looking for data on our site. Um, we also have more studies. Um, than uh, I would hope would be necessary, but um, obviously they are, about what happens when love goes wrong. Um, so lots of studies about dating violence, both um, the actual experience of it, as well as programs aimed at preventing it. Um, so I included two here that are uh, programs among middle schoolers um, trying to, to um, prevent uh, dating violence, as well as um, sexual harassment, things like that. Both of them are studies that randomly assigned people to different conditions. Um, so for the, the New York City one, it had um, students doing classroom-based uh, work around dating um, violence prevention. Um, they had a group that had school-wide programs they had a group that had both classroom and school-wide, and then they also had um, a control group where, where they didn't the interventions. And they looked at um, behaviors and attitudes pre um, the assignment to the group, right when the, when the um, program ended, and then again, um, five or six months out after that to see what the longer-term effects were. Um, and the, the screen grab that I um, have here came from that, that uh, NYC study. And it's, um, it asks students whether they've ever had someone make unwanted sexual comments, gestures, or looks at them. Um, and about 30% of the students said that they did. Um, and in most cases, sorry, yeah, 30% of students. Um, adding in my head and talking at the same time is not my strength. Um, anyway, uh, most of them who reported having been the recipient of such comments or gestures 
um, received them from males, 17% received them from males, 10% from females. So, and then uh, we also have a small study of wife abuse among Vietnamese immigrants. So again, a pretty specific population, but longitudinal data um, that kind of looks at uh, the experience as people are coming, um, uh, as they're early in the US and then kind of um, what happens to the marriage and the support networks of the, the wives after that. I said that there would be some lighthearted parts to this discussion. It's probably um, that uh, when love goes wrong definitely does not fit that. Um, but these next couple slides do. They, they kind of just look at what we say we love. Um, so there is a question in our um, data about what uh, your favorite flower is. It comes from a New York Times poll. Um, and the most overwhelmingly, the most um, common favorite flower is a rose, not probably not unexpectedly. Um, I also looked at uh, this next chart is favorite color um, from the ja Japanese, so, bleh, Japanese General Social Survey. Um, and you can see that blue uh, is by far the winner, um, followed by green and pink. Um, and so I wondered if we had the same data about the United States. Um, we didn't, but you know, there's this thing called Google. So um, I Googled, Googled it and I found that um, in the US, the, the color patterns are about the same. So um, most popular for both males and females is blue. Um, second most popular for males is green um, and for females is purple. So, um, so pretty similar to uh, Japanese. We also have a question from a 1960s survey about, um, this is from one of the Detroit area studies about uh, TV shows that people watched. So it lists out a number of TV, different TV shows um, like Ann Southern, Bachelor Father, um, I Love Lucy, um, Bold Venture, Cannonball, lots of things I had not heard of. Um, and it asks them how many of those uh, TV shows they regularly watch. And so that's what the description um, or the frequency table shows. So. It was uh, the 1960s, so like literally this one was from 1960. Um, so TV still wasn't as big of a thing. So you can see that um, that people who watch none of those shows actually make up the biggest chunk of the respondents in that case. So almost 50% um, hadn't seen any of them or didn't watch any of them regularly. Um, this is from the Gansu Poverty and Education Project. Um, it asks about favorite sport um, and kicking shuttlecocks, which I had never heard of and can't really imagine, is, um, is uh, listed as the favorite. Tab table tennis is the second. So again, I wanted to do a US comparison, and this one we do have. Um, and uh, here, Football, probably no surprise, um, followed by baseball or softball is listed as uh, the favorite sport. Um, the three in general social survey, I told you we had a number of those um, partner uh, general social survey like uh, studies, asked people about their favorite cultural activity um, and listening to music and watching movies uh, came out as the top. Um, so probably not a surprise. Um, so then I, I decided to look at the foods that we like, because, um, you know, it's all about good food, right? So we do have a study. Um, this is most of these are from um, CBS or ABC News polls. Um, this one looks at your favorite, um, favorite food that you know is bad for you, but you crave it anyway. Um, and so the top two are chocolate and ice cream. I can only imagine that chocolate ice cream is probably... Uh, right up there above everything else. Um, but I also found it interesting that the next highest were red meat and pizza. Um, I would not have guessed the red meat one. Um, it turns out not only do we have favorite foods, but we have favorite summer foods. Um, and so this shows that uh, barbecue is our 
favorite summer food followed by watermelon and then there's our friend ice cream. Um, and not only do we have favorite summer foods, but in the barbecue category, um, people prefer beef barbecue to anything else with chicken as a close second. Um, so the things you can find in our data. Um, and because this was timely, uh, there were two uh, CBS news polls, um, 2010 and 2013, that asked people about their favorite snacks during the Super Bowl. Um, so chicken wings comes out at the top, pizza um, is right up there. And uh, when I read the one about, I was of course doing this be right before I, um, before lunchtime and I hadn't eaten anything. And I was like, now I want guacamole and chips. But anyway, um, I just love this question, so I included it. Um, this is from the National Center for Teacher Effectiveness Study. Um, and the question is, because of this teacher, I am learning to love math. And um, you can see that uh, most students answer that that is at least somewhat true. Um, so if you love math, you should probably thank a teacher. I said I would look uh, briefly about at the questions that we have about love, um, and I just grouped these into two groupings, um, the ones that were sort of expected. Um, so have you ever been kissed or have you ever kissed someone? Um, we have lots of that questions in lots of different studies, both um, US and international. Um, different questions related to um, love related uh, being a value that's linked to happiness or satisfaction or job satisfaction, marital satisfaction, things like that. Um, overall satisfaction with love life um, comes up a lot. Um, then there are questions about sex. So um, this should say, did you have sex? Uh, or no, sorry, it's right. Did sex with your spouse or partner make you feel loved? Or did the respondent have sex to feel loved? Um, there's also, did the respondent have sex to express love? Um, there are, are questions that ask about whether one's children feel loved, um, as well as from the children's perspective, uh, whether their, their parent or guardian is loving or affectionate. Um, and then uh, just some general questions that I love children one came from ad health. I'm not um, really sure what the context of that one was, but it was um, how often do you say I love children or how often do you feel that you love children? Um, slightly unexpected questions um, that came up when I did a search on the word love. Um, what difference would it make in your daily life if you became convinced that there is no loving God caring for you? Um, I feel God's love for me directly. Those are from different studies, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then uh, here's one that I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would know how to answer. Um, everyone wants their children to love and respect them. However, if your child could not give you both love and respect in general, which one would you prefer? Um, so people asking lots of creative questions. And then I just wanted to give a nod to open ICPSR. These are the self-published data. Um, and so I did a couple searches on there and just kind of wanted to show you what came up. Um, so a search on love brought brought up the fact that busy people love leftovers, um, which is very true, um, as well as uh, replication data for a number of other studies. Um, one that I found interesting and didn't know that we had is the drag artist interviews um, from 2019. These were collected by college students, and it's actually the transcript of, um, of all of the interviews. So it's kind of fascinating. It took you know, I always love doing these presentations because I find new things and that one, um, that one took my attention for a little while. I also looked up friend or friendship um, and you have uh, some of the similar kinds of data sets um, with a little help from my friends. Again, friendship and social support, uh, friends in high places, um, Facebook interaction uh, data and a survey of people from Korea. Um, so again, uh, a fairly um, good range of studies. And then lastly, I looked at sexual because I was trying to get at some of the behavioral stuff. Um, this one popped up 
um, a number of different kinds of themes. So sexual harassment, um, sexual diversity is the second one. Um, sexual assault in the college party culture um, is the third one. Uh, sexual orientation is the fourth one. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to the uh, the PI on that uh, sexual orientation study was a former um, intern of ICPSR before I got involved in the intern program, but um, from, from student intern to data depositor, that's what we like to see. Um, and then we also have the pleasure study that's down here at number nine and asexual identified women and men revolt, results from a nationally representative probability sample. So again, a range of studies looking at um, different types of love and different, um, uh, different orientations. Um, and so that is all I have. And I am happy to take questions. Um, if anyone stayed awake, I, yeah, or we can, you can have 11 minutes of your day back. I do see a couple of questions coming in. Um, Dr. Holter, there was a question about loving your pets. Do you have any data there? I do not because I thought we had it. Um, and then I looked and I could not find it. Oh, so, so that's a call out to the people who are in attendance. If you have data on loving your pets, maybe the person who asked that question, um, bring it on over. Exactly. Yeah, I, um, I wanted to talk about that, but I looked, um, I looked at both love of animals and that didn't bring anything up. And then I looked at pets, but it, uh, I looked at pet, but that's a root to a whole bunch of different words. So I got like 35,000 variables. Um, and as I was looking through them, I none obviously jumped out as being about your actual pet. So I have somebody jumping in in the chat who's saying that puppy pulls up 42 study results. So it may be that we have ah. lots more data than we thought we did. Um, thank you for posting that. I will send a link to that here in the chat. Again, that clearly shows that um, how you search matters. Yes. I bet if puppy pulls up 42, then cats probably pull up, I don't know, 70, given that cats are better than dogs. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, here we go. I would love to see what we have on parrots. We have a... a um, a love of parrots here at ICPSR. So they're, uh, I, did I bet not you know that. Yes. You don't know about the parrots? I don't. Oh, oh, look at this. We have, we also have 42 results on parrots at ICPSR. Go figure. <laughs> One of them has no, 11 of them have to do with childcare. So who knows? <laughs> who knows? Maybe it's about how children parrot what they hear. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Oh, I bet you're right. That's interesting. I wonder. Um, awesome. Thank you for, uh, for the questions. I see a couple of other messages um, saying thank you to Dr. Holter. So thank you. This has been tremendous. Um, I know there were a couple of questions that were asked uh, about getting access to specific studies. Um, and I think that we have responded to all of those in the chat, but if you had any questions, um, any other questions, please let us know. I'm seeing more coming into the chat. It looks like people are really excited about these, uh, these pet searches. So um, <laughs> someone else is giving us a, if you look up pet in quotes, um, it gives us a lot of uh, pet results as well. Thank you for that link. I'm going to send that. Holy macaroni. It's 3,500 results. All right, here See, we go. That's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> but there is some good stuff. Look at this pet therapy. There's dogs. Are you personally taking care of pets? Oh, interesting pets. Um, uh, in hurricanes, um, I did see those. Yeah. Oh, this is fascinating. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you so much for that <laughs> link. Let me put this in. Link to pet related. Uh, looks like this is a variable search. Um, and if you are that... new to data, variables are kind of like questions. The questions that were asked maybe in a survey. There we go. Oh, pets and earthquakes. We're seeing people. Oh my goodness. I absolutely love this. 
Um, Lynette, do you want to pull? Um, so if anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to uh, to message uh, Dr. Holter directly. There we go. Um, but as we're uh, so this concludes the actual presentation <laughs> of today's Love Data Week. Um, was it love at first sight? This was awesome. I the our chat is going a little bonkers right now, so we're going to go ahead and and keep having that conversation. But I do want to close this out for um, anyone who was just here for for this specific conversation. This has been tremendous, Dr. Holter. Thank you for pulling all of this together. I saw folks as we were in the in the um, Google slides together, frantically, you know. Um, clicking along uh, with what you were looking at. So thank you for making that available as we were talking. Do you have anything else you want to plug as we uh, as we close out? Um, did you plug in the chat the the Love Data Week survey? No, I did not. Let me pull that up. In Do you want to talk about it? Of Love Data Week, um, this year's theme is uh, data is for everyone. Um, and we know that some people have some strong feelings about whether it should be data is or data are. Um, and I know that uh, Anna's hoping for data, data is team to win, and I'm hoping for the team data are. Um, so far, her team is killing my team. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it's just uh, it. It's uh, I don't know. I think it might be just that I'm out there telling people that they need to vote my way, or else. No, I'm kidding. Exactly. Um, so this is my moment to say <laughs> vote for data are no. <laughs> And, and if this, anyone, they're never going to let us do one of these together again. I know, I know, right? They're going to be like, listen, Love Data Week was fun, but that Anna and Dr. Holter, they had a whole thing going. <laughs> um, uh, if you are uh, just looking at that survey, so basically what we mean by data is versus data are is uh, like, would you say data is cool or data are cool or some mix of that? Um, <laughs> I see somebody posting in the chat that Anna's definitely been reaching out. So yeah, I, I've been trying to sway the vote. I'm not going to lie. I've been trying. <laughs> um, fabulous. Thank you. Um, I see people are, are clicking through there to take that survey. I am so excited to get to see the results of that. And I should say, let me pull up this link too. If you, um, if you haven't already, Love Data Week has a... Um, uh, email list. And if you're interested in knowing the results of that survey, um, sign up for that email list and we should have those results out, I think tomorrow or maybe next week. Um, let me just pull that up real quick. And any other questions in the chat? Oh, oh, I see a pet adoption link. All right. This is a link to pet adoption data. And again, uh, oops, that's not the right one here. Hang on, link to pet adoption data uh, for reals this time. And that is this. Thank you so much to the folks who are putting in these links into the chat. Oh, uh, my screen has gone. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, ever be known as the webinar that went off the rails? <laughs> <laughs> I think we are we are uh, listening to our audience. Um, <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. Um, do you think most pet owners love their pets more than other human beings or not? So here's a really great one. Uh, there's the results. Oh my gosh, that is fantastic. Thank you for putting that in. That's funny. That's the kind of question I was looking for and I didn't find it. So thank you to whoever found it. That is so good. <laughs> oh my goodness. I love this. Um, okay. Let me see if I can find that link real quick to anyone who is wanting to sign up for the Love Data Week email list. And then I promise we will let you go um, about the rest of your day. But boy, this has been fun. Thank you, Dr. Holter. This has been like just a kind of a treat of a webinar. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> and if anybody else is um, has you know questions or other ideas for pet related stuff, let us know. Okay, here we go. Um, Love Data Week email list sign up form and also um anna mentioned if you have other ideas for 
things that could um, go with this webinar, keep sharing them. Um, I would also, if you've been to one of these sort of data showcase webinars before and have a feeling about whether this format worked better than you know, the format that I used before, feel free to let me know as well. Or if you're like, nope, you need to keep trying, then I will keep trying and do something different next time. <laughs> Something tells me you're you're doing pretty well. I'm seeing a lot of clicks through to uh, to different data that are available. I appreciate this as a discovery. I, there's so much data at ICPSR that I didn't know existed. So this has been really fun for me personally. Thank you to everyone. Oh my gosh, mm, thank you. We have somebody who's posting. I've never been to one of these before, but I am inspired. Um, <laughs> thanks. That is so lovely. And uh, someone else says this was tons of fun. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Thank you all for being here. Um, we'll go ahead and close this now, um, but this has been a treat. Please do continue the conversation. Um, we are on social media along with everybody else this week at Love Data 22. Um, that's hashtag Love Data 22. Um, and you know how to connect with Dr. Holter and I if you have any questions. Thank you all for being here and we will see you at the rest of Love Data Week. Thank you.